Welcome to the second floor of the coach house. During Mr. Balzer's time, he used this space as a carpentry shop for his son, Martin. Today, we use this area for exhibits. This room is dedicated to the memory of Historical Society member, Ruth Gellings. Ruth left a large part of her estate to the Historical Society, donated several quilts to the collection, and was a volunteer for the museum. On the south wall of the second floor of the coach house, we have our display on how fiber becomes cloth. Cotton fibers were harvested from many of the area farms. Flax fiber or linen fiber was also another plant product that was made into cloth. Finally, wool from a sheep was used for spinning into yarn and into products for the home. So after the fibers were collected from the farm, they had to be cleaned. There were special tools with teeth to clean the fibers for flax and also for wool that was shorn from the sheep. Once the fiber was cleaned, it had to be spun into thread or yarn. The spinning wheel was how this was accomplished. It added the twist to the fiber, creating the yarn. A yarn winder then was used to create skeins of wool, cotton, or flax yarn. Back in the early days in Addison, cloth was saved and used to make quilts. Here are some examples of some early quilts in the collection of the Addison Historical Museum. Quilting was not only practical, but provided a social activity for women on the farm. In the center case on the second floor of the coach house are examples of tools that you would commonly find on a farm in Addison. The museum also has a nice collection of railroad lanterns. Here we have them displayed hanging from the rafters of the second floor of the coach house. This exhibit explores the life of the late 19th, the early 20th century woman living in rural Addison. Her life centered on the home. In addition to caring for her children, she managed the cooking, laundry, cleaning, and sewing. Household management books suggested weekly schedules to handle the often tedious work. Monday was for washing laundry, Tuesday was for ironing and mending, Wednesday and Saturday were for baking, and Thursdays and Saturdays were for thorough cleaning of the kitchen and parlor. By the 1920s, technological advances made the task of housework much less demanding on the housewife. Each morning, the housewife would have to rekindle the stove fire. Cast iron stoves were either wood or coal burning and required a lot of maintenance and care. Ash had to be removed, kindling set, dampers and flues adjusted, and fire lit. In addition, the woman had to prepare three meals a day. This included a large breakfast, which was more substantial than our modern breakfast, and included bread, cooked potatoes, cooked and raw fruit, and beef, ham, or fish, a family dinner, and a lunchtime meal for her and the children. Baking was seen as a separate task from cooking and was usually done two to three times a week. The housewife also performed seasonal preserving of fruits, vegetables, and meats. She maintained the household garden and tended to the livestock and poultry. Cooking utensils were originally made out of cast iron and were heavy and difficult to clean. By 1900, enamel and aluminum kitchenware became available, which were both lighter and easier to clean. By the 1920s, gas stoves, refrigerators, and more specialized kitchen equipment such as the egg beater, flour sifter, and meat grinder became readily available 
and made daily kitchen chores less taxing. Washing clothes and linens was probably the most labor-intensive weekly task. Monday was usually wash day. On Sunday night, the clothes would be sorted and put in tubs of warm water to soak. The next morning, the clothes, first the delicates and whites, then the calicos and ginghams, followed by the woolens, would be put into a hot suds bath and washed by rubbing the article against the washboard or using a plunger. Then the clothes would be wrung out and the soap rubbed onto the most soiled spots. The clothes would then be placed in a closed boiler on the stove and boiled. After removal from the stove, the laundry would be rubbed again, then rinsed in plain water, wrung out, rinsed with bluing, wrung out very dry, dipped in starch if desired, and wrung out once more. Then the clothes were either hung outside on the line to dry or on an indoor drying rack. Before indoor running water, the housewife had to go outside to get the water from the well. A single load of laundry used approximately 50 gallons of water. By the 1920s, laundry became less burdensome with the introduction of indoor hot and cold running water and electric washing machines like this one. The heavy lifting of cardi of water and hand cranking and washboard scrubbing that were once hallmarks of laundry day were eliminated. The next day was ironing day. Several cast irons would be heated on the stove at the same time so that as the heat of one iron dissipated, a new hot iron could be substituted. Triangular irons were called coarse irons. Irons with rounded edges at both ends were known as polishing irons. Crimping or pleating irons were also used for pleats and ruffles. By the 1920s, electric irons also ended the need for multiple irons heating simultaneously on the stove. Household management books of the period encouraged housewives to, quote, tidy up the parlor and kitchen every day. This involved sweeping the kitchen floor, cleaning the parlor rug with a carpet sweeper, light dusting, and wiping off soot and trimming wicks of kerosene lamps. Each spring and autumn, a more intensive cleaning occurred, which involved removing carpets and beating them clean, washing windows and mirrors, scouring painted walls, polishing furniture, organizing closets, packing out of season clothes, and re-wicking and thoroughly cleaning kerosene lamps. By the 1920s, the introduction of electricity made household cleaning much easier. Electric lights replaced high maintenance kerosene lamps and electric vacuums available on the installment plan made carpet cleaning much easier. The woman of the house was also charged with sewing and mending of the family's clothing, knitting and crocheting woolen gear for the winter, and hand quilting bed coverlets. Sewing was part of the social life of women as they were taught needlework skills at a young age and often got together with other women to sew. With the introduction of the foot treadle sewing machine in the mid 19th century, a woman's time spent sewing was freed up tremendously. Clothing patterns, first available in ladies' magazines and later by direct purchase, made the process even simpler. By 1900, men's clothing became available for retail purchase, so the housewife could focus her sewing just on herself and her children. She could purchase fabric at the local general merchandise store for this purpose. If she was not a skilled sewer, she could hire a seamstress to assist her. By the 1920s, stores selling women's and children's ready-to-wear clothing and underwear began to appear. This led to the decline of the seamstress industry and the need for a housewife to sew her family's clothes. In the mid-19th century, Congress slashed its postage rates for letters which led to a dramatic increase in the number of letters mailed in America. What had been used primarily by businesses and government agencies became an affordable means of communication for the average American. 
In the late 19th century, the addition of the postal card and rural free delivery directly to farms further expanded the use of the U.S. postal system by private citizens. The woman of the house had the major responsibility for carrying out family correspondence. Letter writing manuals of the period instructed her on the proper quality and color for writing paper, pens and ink, the correct salutation, style, tone, and closings to use in a letter, and the importance of clear handwriting. The art of correspondence by mail was a critical skill until our nation's telephone system matured in the mid 20th century and Americans could phone their loved ones and friends directly. This is a large scale model of the Heidemann Mill that used to stand just east of Mill Road and north of Lake Street on the Heidemann Farm. What's good about this particular model is that it shows how the windmill could be positioned to catch the wind to use it to power the grist mill that was inside the windmill. The top of the windmill could be turned so that it would take up the wind so that once it was in the wind, the blades would start to rotate. If you would like to visit an existing mill that was similar to the Heidemann Mill, you can visit Fabian's Windmill in Batavia, Illinois.